Okay. Um, today we are talking about temporal semiotics. I've spelled it without the extra E in the title, but you'll see other spellings of it. Purse had a preferred spelling, but most people spell it like this, semiotics today. Um, and, and the reason I'm talking about this is to, um, is just to enter into a particular sort of empirical problem and talk about some of the misunderstandings that can occur when people don't separate semantics from syntax or semiotics, the various components of uh, semiosis. So um, uh, this is life among the Pitahas. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about them today. Um, I have done field research on over 20 Amazonian groups. Um, I've done field, I've done not field research, but I've done research on Salishan languages of North America, and I've done field research on Mayan languages of Central America. So I've worked on in all three of the Americas. I've published papers on languages in all those continents, subcontinents. Um, but uh, out of the 40 years of off and on field research I've done, uh, the most, the, by far the longest period of time was with the Pinahas. It's where I did my master's degree and my PhD in Brazil on this language um, and have uh, written about it quite a bit. So the Pitahas are located here in Brazil, um, just south of Manaus, southwest of Manaus, northeast of Porto Velho. Um, if I fly from Porto Velho, it takes about an hour and 45 minutes to get to the closest village. If I fly from Manaus, it takes just over two hours, so it's fairly close. I don't normally go by plane. I usually, fly, I usually take my motorboat and go in when I was going there regularly, or I rent a boat. Um, but when you come in by plane, you land on the river because there's no airstrip, and this is what it looks like. Oops. Um, well, that was supposed to be a uh, video, but apparently in the slide, in the current mode that I'm using it, it won't do that. But anyway, you can see what it looks like to come into the river on a float plane, and in that vast jungle live, uh, the Pitahas and we'll land on there um, and then uh, taxi down river or up river a little bit more to the village. So um, I want to start off with a couple of quotes about time since we're talking about time. Um, Einstein said, I've seen this quote from Einstein many times but I can't find the source. So supposedly Einstein said somewhere, space and times, Space and time are modes by which we think, not conditions under which we live. Um, as you all will know, Immanuel Kant, the famous German philosopher, had a lot to say about space and time as well. Uh, Peirce said that to say, therefore, that thought cannot happen in an instant, but requires a time, is but another way of saying that every thought must be interpreted in another, or that all thought is in signs. And uh, two more quotes, because people had different perspectives on time. One of the greatest uh, philosophers of all time is um, the man often referred to as St. Augustine. Uh, perhaps it might be said rightly that there are three times, a time present of things past, a time present of things present, and a time present of things future. For these three coexist somehow in the soul, for otherwise I could not see them. The time present of things past is memory. The time, the time present of things present is direct experience. The time present of things future is expectation. And then there is the verse from the Bible, the passage from Ecclesiastes 3 verses 1 through 8, uh, that was turned into a very popular folk song in the 60s by Pete Seeger, uh, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose unto heaven. Um, there are a lot of misunderstandings about Pita Ha time in the literature because um, there have been a lot of newspaper reports and magazine reports about things that I've said, and um, those aren't accurate by and large. You have to go to the original sources and read what I've actually written. 
Um, so one of the misunderstandings is because the pitaha have no past tense marking on the verb, they don't know about the past. Well, that's a very silly thing to say. If you think about English, English doesn't have a future tense, uh, not at least morphologically. So if I say, I will go to town tomorrow, um, that's clearly the future, but there's no future tense. There's a modal auxiliary, will, uh, but the rest of it is uh, present except for the time word tomorrow. So between the modal auxiliary and the time word tomorrow, we get the future tense semantically in Pinaha, although there is no future tense morphosyntactically, or at least morphologically in Pinaha. This is a constant confusion to for categories like tense, um, uh, to think that if it the morphology and the semantics are one and the same. So if you lack the morphology, you lack the semantics, but that's just not true. Semantics is a very um, uh, rich area that is to some degree independent of syntax. This is a position that Kenneth Pike took uh, more than 60 years ago. And it is a position that uh, several researchers out of Ohio State take today in their model of convergent grammar. Um, the Pitahas avoid talk about the distant past and the distant future. And some people have taken this to mean that they cannot think about the distant past or the distant future, or they can never mention these subjects. These are both false. Avoiding talk about the distant past and the distant future is just that, avoiding. It's not a uh, complete prohibition. It is like uh, good manners uh, in English. I mean, if you sit down at a table um, in, in most countries, European countries, you won't wipe your mouth with your hand uh, when you're done eating. You'll probably look for a napkin. There's no law that says you have to do that. Your host is not gonna stand up and scream at you if you wipe your hand with your mouth, uh, your mouth with your hand. Uh, it's just not done. These things are avoided. They're cultural values. And it's the same thing with talk about time and pitaha. A lot of this is governed by cultural values. Um, so there's an ontology and a phenomenology of time in terms of the phenomenology or what Peirce would have called the phaneroscopy. Our experiences are vaguely suggestive of something timelike, but what is it for languages? I mean, how do we translate this phenomenology, this feeling I have this very vague feeling of time passing, um, how do we translate that into languages? Um, and, and where do we get these feelings? And what is time? Is it part of universal grammar or part of the world that we weave into language? How much variation do we see in time marking and time semantics when we go across the world? This is a very important area to look at. One way that we feel the passage of time is in our thoughts. Thoughts come in sequences, as Peirce pointed out in the quote that we've just seen. The sun passes overhead. It's one place in the morning. It's another place at noon. It's another place in the evening. The days shorten and lengthen. Even trees notice this. In Massachusetts, where I am right now, the high, well, when I got up this morning, the temperature was 22 degrees Fahrenheit, which is quite cold and disappointing because it's the month of March and I wanted it to be warmer. But the days are getting longer and the trees notice this. So all the trees are starting to grow leaves. Um, just as when um, the days start to grow shorter in October and, and following, uh, the trees start to lose their leaves. So the trees notice the passing of time and they act in accordance. They interpret it by the gaining or losing of leaves in a deciduous forest. Um, the days lengthen, um, as we've seen, that it's getting uh, later here. Uh, in Massachusetts, the sun's going down later. You know, in the, in the wintertime, the sun goes down around 4.30. And in the uh, longest days in June, it goes down around 10.30 p.m. So there's quite a bit of uh, change, unlike the Amazon, where the sun tends to come up at 6 and go down at 6 uh, every day of the year. We notice the different stages of the moon. We age, you know, the person that looks back at me 
from the mirror today is not the person who looked back at me from the mirror um, uh, decades ago. Um, quite disappointing, actually, but I certainly noticed the uh, passage of time. Events and changing states are vaguely felt, and these all serve as the foundation of temporal semantics and semiotics. So how is it that there is an interpretation? How is it that there is a semantics? And when I say interpretation, I mean in the Persian sense, um, without a sign or representamen. That just means how can we have a temporal semantics in a language like Pitaha that lacks morphemes for time? How can we do that? Well, remember that in Persis semiosis, there are three major components. There's the object, there's the sign, and there is the way that that is interpreted, uh, linking one sign to another. So let's say that the object is um, a perceived passing of time that I want to have a, I want to have a sign for that you can interpret. That sign, the sign for time, is required because you can't have an interpretation without a sign and an object. Um, so the but the sign doesn't have to be linguistic. It doesn't have to be um, uh, one sign. You can have many to one mappings from signs to meanings. So you can have a couple of signs that are required to indicate one meaning. This is uh, the old idea of the circumflex, which is. Uh, maybe seen in German past tense where you get GE at the beginning and EN at the end of the verb, and that's interpreted the whole thing as, uh, as past tense. Um, and there can be many to one mappings. Um, there are a couple of different articles, um, and I've included the links here. Um, not that you, you know, I can send these links to you directly if you send me an email on the course site. Um, the first one is by that I, I've actually already sent you by Lydia Rodriguez on the use of gestures in telling times in Mayan languages. Um, and this is actually reminiscent for me of a paper that uh, my first professor, Kenneth Pike, presented about 45 years ago. I wasn't as good a student as I should have been, so I can't remember the reference and if he even ever published it, but he talked about only being able to interpret the Mayan calendars if we understand current Mayan speakers' gestures. Uh, the next paper is by Simeon Floyd of the Max Planck Institute, who did field research in Brazil as well, and wrote a paper on gestures and time in Yengatu which was, uh, is still a, a spoken uh, language descended from, uh, it's a sort of mixed language between Portuguese and Tupi, uh, in particular Tupi Namba, that is spoken still in a few regions around Manaus. And he has written this very interesting paper in the Journal of the Linguistic Society of America on um, multi, multimodality um, multimodal representations of time in Nyingatu. So these are really interesting papers and I strongly recommend that you uh, get them. If you can't find them or you don't have access to them, uh, let me know. I've already sent you the first one. I'll be happy to send you the second one. So there aren't that many time expressions in Pitaha and the ones that we do have tend to be composed, but let's go ahead and look at some of the major time expressions in Pitaha. The first one is ahuapio, which means another day. It doesn't mean yesterday and it doesn't mean tomorrow, although it can be used for both of those. It just means other day, not right now, not today. Uh, so there is no word in Pinaha for yesterday. There is no word for tomorrow. There is just a word for other day, another day. There is a word pe'e, which means now. Um, there is a word Sotwa, which means already. Hua means day. Ahuai means night. Uh, these all have an etymology, and I've talked about the potential et etymologies of all of these words, but I won't go into those here. Uh, none of these are just simple forms, however. 
Uh, and then there is a word like peaiso, low water, which is the dry season. Pebigaiso, which is high water or the rainy season. It is um, April now, so the rainy season is ending and the water is at its peak uh, on the Mycee. The Mycee, uh, the river will come up 25 meters, uh, 75 feet or so. Uh, it will go from low water to high water. It's an enormous rise of water, very impressive. Um, and uh, so this is another way the Pitahas are, are sensitive to time and they have words to describe these times. Um, kahai ogeso, kahai ai ogeso, which means full moon. And hiso, during the day, hisogiai means noon. Hibigibaga aiso, sunrise or sunset, that works for both of them. Ahuakohuaihio, early morning before sunrise. Uh, so these are the most common Pitaha expressions, and there's not a whole lot more, although you can always coin new expressions and new words. Um, it's an active living language. So, uh, uh, but these are, these are some of the important words. And with these words, you can start to get a sense of how you can communicate time, even without tense morphology in Pitaha. Um, but they alone, they alone are not enough to represent uh, precise temporal semantics in Pitaha. So I'll just be using that. This theory is, uh, I published a paper in 1993 on tense in Pitaha. And this was the theory that I used. It comes from the work of Hans Reichenbach and the philosopher and with some tweaks to the system by Norbert Hornstein back in uh, 1990 or so. And um, so although I don't, I don't care which theory you use, this was the theory I used, so I'll continue to use it. So in the Reichenbachian system, there are three principal time coordinates. There is the moment of utterance or speech, S. There is the moment of the event, E. And there is the reference point, R. So if the reference point, the moment of speech, and the event are simultaneous, that's present tense. A comma means simultaneous. Mm -hmm. If there is a line, if, if the moment of speech precedes the reference point and the event, um, that means it's future tense. I'm talking about something that is in, in the future from when I'm talking. Mm -hmm. If the um, event and the reference point precede the moment of speech, we're talking about past tense. If the event precedes the reference point, which re precedes the moment of speech, we're talking about the past perfect. Uh, let me give you an example. Um, when John arrived, I had already eaten. I had already eaten is past perfect. When John arrived is past tense. So um, the event of um, me eating is prior to the reference point, which is John's arrival. And they're both prior to the moment of speech or utterance. So it's past. And because the reference point um, uh, is defined separately from the moment of speech and the event, it's a perfect. If the moment of speech precedes the event and the event precedes the uh, reference point, then we're talking about the future perfect. So when you arrive, I will have eaten. That's the future perfect. So the reference point precedes the event you are, your arrival. Um, so that is a future perfect. And when the event precedes both the simultaneous moment of speech and reference point, we're talking about the per present perfect, I have eaten. Um, that's a fairly simple, straightforward way of representing the basic tenses of English. Although as you all will know or suspect, if you've had linguistics background, things are never as simple as that. Um, so here are some examples from a paper I published in 1993, so of time words in Pitaha. So sotwa, which I said meant already. In a sentence, I could say chisotwa, kahape, I'm going now. But that could also mean I already left. The more natural meaning is that I'm going now. Um, so ogio, which means big time, a long time ago, or a long time from now. So I can say awi, so ogio, goai. The foreigner died a long time ago. Or I can say, 
Aoiso Ogil, Oaboy, Hai Maosai, the foreigner will buy cloth some time from now. So uh, this is about as close as you get to distant future reference, but it's not, it's not like the 23rd century or something like that. Piai so low water time, Ogiai hit Piai so abo by my Sihiai. Dan will return. That's my name in Pitaha. It used to be Ogiai. It's not anymore. Will return in the summer. Pe big eye, so big water time. So these are examples. You can see the various examples. There's some uh, or, ordering kinds of uh, temporal ordering metaphors as well. So uh, by which literally means head, can be used for first. So you go first. Noi uh, by opita, you go first. Uh, so you head go. You go in front. So if we're, I can say we're going to go one at a time down the river. You go first. I'll, I might go tomorrow. Or I could say we're, we're making a line of people to walk into the jungle, and I want you in the first position. So that's how you would say that. Chohyo means next. Kohoi uh, So this was a sentence I got when a guy was telling me that he was older than his little brother. He's, they don't have words for numbers, but he said, I had born, he but born. Uh, it, it basically refers to the but. So born first, born last. But is a metaphor for last and pinaha. Uh, Gaba, which means then or next, sequential. He was born first, then the other brother was born next. You could also say that. Um, and so uh, there are words of temporal meaning in pinaha. In Persis terms, these are all symbols. Um, and what we're trying to get at is how symbols can be used in ways unlike English or Portuguese uh, to uh, communicate a relatively precise temporal semantics and how precise you are and how precise you need to be is a cultural question. So um, in my doctoral dissertation, which was written in Portuguese, I'll translate this for you. I talked about absolute tenses in Pinaha. So I said that, um, the telic aspect expressed by ao represents uh, the realization of an action, which is an accomplishment. Uh, the action has been accomplished, uh, an action perceived by the speaker as having been reached or fulfilled. Um, together with the suffix be perfective and ao frequently is translated as past tense. So um, I, arrow, uh, see, with the telic and the perfective and the continuative and the remote, which we'll talk about, I was seeing uh, an arrow. I was seeing an arrow. So this is past tense, but there's no past tense marker. There are aspectual distinctions that lead to a past tense interpretation. Did the meat run out? So it's literally animal, negative, telic, perfective, interrogative, interrogative. Um, the one marks the verb as a yes, no question. The other one marks the sentence as an interrogative. Um, so can you, you can say, did the meat run out, which is a past tense uh, sort of reading. And you can use them again to get, I will be eating meat. You can say, I eat uh, telic imperfective, not the perfective, the continuative remote. That can mean I will be eating meat, or it could mean I was eating meat. Um, but there's no actual tense in there. So when I say, as I have in print many times, Pinaha doesn't have a past tense. I don't mean they don't have a past semantics. I mean, they don't have a verbal suffix that marks tense, just like English doesn't have a verbal suffix that marks, <laughs> marks future tense. Um, there is also, um, oops, sorry about that. Um, I've got to close my messages because they keep coming across my screen and probably will even after I turn this off. Um, so in tense semantics without tense marking, I hope I haven't lost you there. I may have to uh, go back into Zoom and start. Oh, here we go. Um, sorry for the technical screw up there. Um, so. 
In this uh, sentence 350 taken exactly from my PhD dissertation, my analysis of it is quite different today in terms of where the period goes. The period would go after Psi. Uh, but in any case, talking about this, he, he spoke, the foreigner uh, said, I um, am going to kill a pig. Um, we can understand this because of the proximate there's he's going to kill a pig it can also mean he killed a pig um but you can have these interpretations which are governed by context um this proximate aspect frequently appears with the certainty or relative certainty marker and it produces an effect very often but not obligatorily as the immediate future so if you're not quite certain about something maybe it hasn't happened um and proximate means it's nearby, it's in time. Um, so if I use certainty, it, it might lead to a, a past tense interpretation, but you, either one of the certainty or the uncertainty, relative certainty can mean past or future depending on the context. So uh, 350 could mean um, past or future. Uh, and the same is true of example 351 on um, Hisihisai, oh, that's another time word. Uh, so the sun uh, being, um, they use this expression to mean Sunday um, because it actually means not doing anything in the sun. And they've gotten the idea, not from me, although I was a missionary there at one time when I was a believer, not from me, but they've gotten the idea from others that you don't work on Sunday. They never know when Sunday is unless they ask someone. But if it's Sunday, uh, they say, oh, we shouldn't work. But actually, they do. Uh, many of them, they hunt. Uh, so Sunday, I will look for food. Um, it depends on when you say this, what its most lag likely interpretation is. If I say it on Monday, um, it could mean the past. If you say it in the middle of the week, it's more ambiguous if you say it uh, closer to Sunday. Um, but actually, since they don't have names for days of the week, and they don't worry about this, um, unless I've told them what day of the week it is, um, this is a this is an ambiguous phrase, it can mean I will look for me or I did look for me. Um, it can also mean it's Sunday and I'm looking for me. So it, this can be any of the three uh, absolute tenses that Absolute tenses are past, present, and future. Relative tenses are those um, marked by the R term, the reference point, like the past, uh, future, and present perfect. Um, so there's, a, there's something that I've called a remote marker in Pitaha on the verb. And I say that actions which occur inside a larger period in relation to the moment of speech are considered, which are considered less relevant or out of control of the speaker are marked by the aspect remote. Um, so this often has, so it's, it sort of means outside of my control and it can mean future or past, but it depends then on what aspects, what <clears throat> aspects you compare it with, you combine it with. So, um, in another water, uh, he will sorba, which is a tree a sap from a particular species of trees used to make chewing gum, among other things. Um, he will buy telic aspect, perfective, um, remote and complete certainty. So this usually will mean in another water, another year, he will buy or has bought uh, sorba. Um, he wanted to bring a lot, or he wants to bring a lot, or he will want to bring a lot. It simply depends on the uh, context. Um, so sometimes the aspects narrow down the meaning, and sometimes they don't. Um, so I give this an, as, as an example in my thesis, which is 38 years old. Um, it means literally this one sentence in 354, therefore he is eating, therefore he was eating, therefore he will be eating. 
Um, and notice that we get all of this without tense marking with the atelic, an action that hasn't been realized, the imperfective, the continuative, the remote, which is out of my control, and the certainty. Um, and then as a result, which is where we get the word por, uh, portanto or therefore in here. So therefore he is eating, therefore he was eating, was in a state of eating the other, therefore he will be eating. So um, you can get other kinds of tenses. I've already killed a, por a pig, I will go again. Um, and if you look, these are just combinations of aspects. And I could add time words, like if this sotwa, which means already, that pretty much throws it into the past tense with these aspects. Without that, it could be, it would be more ambiguous. Um, and so he's going again. Um, this ta is iterative, he's going again uh, with complete certainty. Um, if I say that when the person is leaving, that's obviously uh, present tense, but it doesn't have to be present tense. It could be future tense, he's going again. Uh, it could be that in Portuguese too, by the way, if we just take ele vai de novo, or in English, he is going again. Either one of those could be, could be present or future, uh, but this could also be past. Um, and uh, uh, so he will drink whiskey or cachaça. Um, it could mean he's drinking cachaça. Uh, so, so the point is, we have to narrow down the interpretation in Peirce's terms. We've got the object, which is time, but to determine the object, we need a sign. And what is the sign? The sign is um, what we have observed in the, in the context that can be part of the sign. So we've sort of got a composite sign here, which means that semiosis gets a little bit more complex than people often talk about it. We've got a mixture of what's in the environment with what's in the sentence with the time words, the lexemes, the morpho morphology. And from all of these things, we put together uh, the most likely temporal reading. Um, so in that sense, uh, for the average Pitaha, there's no more ambiguity than there is in an English sentence, but um, that's because they're completely attuned to what's going on in the environment around them. And they're able to synthesize this interpretation um, and that's what we're doing all the time around us. We're using language, the environment, facial expressions, and all of these things to synthesize an interpretation. Any approach to semantics that fails to look at, take a more holistic approach and look at all the different things that go into the interpretation of an utterance um, is misguided. Also, if you're not looking at all of these things, you will be surprised to know that the same speaker can find something grammatical one day and ungrammatical the next, or one interpretation possible one day and not and not possible the next, depending on the context and what's going on. So when we hear sentences, we're processing them very quickly, but we're also synthesizing them. When you stop to think about it, um, Jerry Fodor made a big deal in his modularity thesis about the fact that people interpret sentences so quickly. But it's actually more complicated than that because we're using the information that's not even in the sentences of the environment and facial expressions and gestures. We're, we're synthesizing an interpretation, which um, for me is a form of compositionality, which goes outside of language. So this is another reason that I've talked about this before, that I don't believe compositionality is linked um, to language per se. I mean, we find it in language, but it's a much more general property about the way our cognition works and we share it with other creatures. Um, so th there are other aspects that, are, that have important time imp implications of Peter Hahn, the atelic aspect, the continuative aspect. Uh, so how are these interpretations again, achieved in a language without tense marking? On the one hand, we have inference. And on the other hand, we have compositionality of the environment, the syntax, the culture, the context, inference. Um, you know, so if, um, if someone tells you, oh yeah, sure, I'm going out right now, that has one meaning without any context around it. Um, but if we look outside and we see that it's raining very hard, um, we, can, we might realize that they're using sarcasm here, or they don't mean that, they mean the opposite of what they just said. 
Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about sequences of tenses. Um, this is an important uh, component. John said that Mary is pregnant. That is um, a sentence that shows something about tense that we haven't talked about yet. Um, some, some researchers call it a dual access reading. So let's, let's think about this. John said that Mary is pregnant. When is Mary pregnant? She's pregnant right now. John said it in the past, said, but Mary is pregnant right now. And we have to be able to get that um, reference. Um, we can't say this usually if, John, if Mary is no longer pregnant. Let's say John said 10 years ago that Mary is pregnant. Uh, in the literature, that's very often considered to be ungrammatical. The interesting thing, however, is that there are very few quanti quantitative studies of these facts in the literature. People tend to just ask another friend who speaks the language, can you say this? And they say, yeah, sure. And so they put it down and they write a paper about it. But you can't really make these kinds of calls without doing more quantitative study. And I should say immediately that... Um, that's exactly what I would like to do among the Peter Ha. I would like to do more quantitative studies. I've done quantitative studies of Peter Ha phonetics and uh, other aspects, but I haven't done quantitative studies of time and time judgments. Um, I have worked with multiple uh, speakers. Um, in any case, when John said that Mary is pregnant, why is it that Mary still has to be pregnant, even though it's because John saying this has to be within nine months, right? John said that Mary is pregnant. That only that sentence is only grammatical if John said it uh, in her nine month pregnancy, because we know the pregnancies last nine months, which is an interesting, very interesting fact. Um, it's perfectly fine to say that John said that Mary was pregnant. So when I say John said that Mary is pregnant, I've had linguists, professional semanticists, uh, reject that sentence. Um, I've had many others accept that sentence, but let's say that everybody accepts that, even though I know that's not the case, the way that we would get it in the Reichenbachian system is to say that um, Mary's pregnancy is linked up to um, uh, the event of John saying. John said it, it's an event that happened at a certain time, um, and Mary is pregnant is only true when linked to the moment of John saying it. Um, in the double access reading, which this is in English, not all languages have this constraint, Italian does, English does, um, we have to know um, when it was said that John said that Mary is pregnant. We have to have, Mary has to be evaluated relative to that subordinate clause, also relative to the when the main clause was uttered. Um, when I say John said that Mary was pregnant, now we don't need to worry about when it was said or, or anything like that. It's, she's not pregnant anymore, so it doesn't, doesn't really matter. Um, so let me see if I, yeah, I wanna just talk a little bit more about that, which is, um, now, two years ago, John said that Mary is pregnant. That's clearly ungrammatical because Mary's not pregnant uh, for, a peer, for more than nine months, and it's already been two years, so it can't be. Two years ago, John said that Mary was pregnant. That's perfect. Then no problem because Mary's not obligated to be pregnant just when John said it because it's in the past tense. Um, but if I say two years ago, John said that Mary is pregnant, that's ungrammatical. But if I say two years ago, John said that Chopin was the greatest pianist that ever lived, but his opinion has changed recently. That's fine. Um, so it's not just a matter of the tenses embedded, but real world knowledge. So John said that Chopin um, is the greatest piano player of all time or composer of all time. Uh, two years ago, John said that Chopin is the greatest composer of all time. That's still fine. And if I say a thousand years ago, uh, Jesus said that Mary is happy. Uh, that might be okay because Mary supposedly lives eternally and her happiness is a characteristic eternally. So all of these readings depend on things that aren't there. They're not actually stated. Um, um, they're, they're real world knowledge. Um, I mean, you could say that pregnant's nine month limitation is based on 
uh, our knowledge of the word pregnant, but then you say, John said that uh, 10 months, 12 months ago, a year ago, John said that the elephant is pregnant. Well, that could still be grammatical, right? If elephants take longer than humans to their pregnancy lasts longer. So all of this is dependent on uh, not merely the uh, algebra of tense that Reichenbach worked out, um, but on real world knowledge. We're synthesizing, even in English and Portuguese, this works the same in Portuguese and other languages. João disse que Maria está grávida, um, era, estava grávida. Uh, these are things that um, the, the facts don't change. Uh, they're still complicated and they still require a synthesis of lexical meaning, syntactic order, um, and knowledge of the real world. Um, the event time, the speech time, and the reference point can be modified by only one adverb at a time. Uh, this is a hypothesis that Hornstein proposes in his book on tense. Um, let's assume that's correct. So I can say in English, tomorrow I have been here a week, but I can never say in English according to this, tomorrow I have been here a week in two hours. You know, So two hours from now, I can say... I, Two hours from now, I can say tomorrow I've been here for a week. Um, the reason that it's ungrammatical is because in two hours has to modify something, and it either modifies R or it modifies E. But E has already mo been modified by a week, and R has already been modified by tomorrow, so there's nothing for in two hours to modify, therefore the sentence is ungrammatical. Um, that seems like a reasonable uh, hypothesis. But you can make it grammatical by saying, John said tomorrow, John will, will say that in two hours, uh, tomorrow I have been here for a week. Um, that makes a little more sense because we've introduced another clause with its own event time and speech time. So we have something else to modify. So we can get the sense of 23B in a discourse, but we can't get it in a single sentence. This is another uh, limitation of the sentence. Very often the things we need to say cannot be expressed in a single sentence. We need uh, a larger uh, context. Uh, Pike might call it a sentence cluster or a paragraph, but we'll simplify that and simply say that sometimes we need a discourse to say what we mean. We can't say it in a sentence. And that's a fact about the way the language works. Um, Peter Ha, I've argued in, in a 1993 paper, so long, long ago, uh, that it only has E and S, it doesn't have an R point. So I, can, I cannot say in Peter Ha, tomorrow I have already been many days on the Maisi River. Um, uh, because I have three time modifiers. and uh, so the three, you know, so tomorrow already and many days. And so if the language lacks an R point, as I argued in my 1993 article, uh, which I think I've sent to you, um, then, um, then one of the adverbs has to go. To express this, we would have to have two sentences. I, I say tomorrow, so, or tomorrow I can't say, or tomorrow I say, I already have been many days on the my sea. Uh, so that's perfectly fine. I can get that meaning across that start in the first example. I can get it in the, by saying it in the bolded example. Um, so if Peter Ha lacks R, an adverbial expression could only modify E, um, then to convey a double modified notion is in a dummy clause, which is what the bold example has. Um, I introduce another E point as a point of reference. So I can get, I can say it, but I need to introduce another E point. It shouldn't be bad to say that um, uh, in English, for example, which it's not. Tomorrow I can say that I've been on the MyC many days. That's fine in English. Uh, it doesn't seem to work with Peter Haas speakers. Again, the double access reading two years ago, John said that Mary was pregnant. Uh, that's fine because each clause has its own tenses. Two years ago, John said that Mary is pregnant. Um, this depends on 
real world knowledge. And I can also change the grammaticality by using what exists in some dialects of English, the historical present. So I can say two years ago, John says that Mary is pregnant. For me, that's perfectly grammatical to use says there, um, even though it's in the past tense, because says has a restricted use in some dialects, including my own, in which it's a historical present. And in the, if I use the historical present, that sentence becomes grammatical. Um, so once again, to sum up, these readings depend on culture, on overt marking and context. John said that Mary is happy. For some, that's okay. For others, it's ungrammatical, believe it or not. John said that Bach is considered the greatest composer of all time. This also seems to be fine for everyone. Quantificational study needed, though. Real world knowledge is once again interpreted into the interpretations of such examples. Um, we can say, for example, two years ago, John said that Bach is the greatest composer of all time, but John seems to have changed his mind recently. Uh, so Bach is the greatest composer of all time. That's grammatical because greatest composer of all time lasts forever, right? Uh, pregnancy doesn't last forever. So I couldn't say two years ago, John said that Bach is happy. Um, um, could I say, let's see, two years ago, John said that Bach is the happiest composer of all time. Uh, I don't think we could say that in English uh, right off the top of my head. Again, quantification study would be needed, but I would have to say two years ago, John said that Bach was the happiest composer of all time. You have to be alive to be happy. And since Bach is dead, I've been to the church in Leipzig where he's buried and looked at what, although nobody really knows that he's buried there, but assuming that he's buried in that church in Leipzig, um, um, he can't be happy anymore. He can't be sad. Those, those adjectives no longer fit a dead person. Uh, but the greatest composer of all time, that is the way that you can describe a dead person. Um, so um, the sentence is, is okay. Um, and, and this means that we're using, again, real world knowledge in our interpretation. Um, two years ago, John said that Mary is happy. It, in a direct speech, that's okay. Two years ago, John said, Mary's happy. Um, but it's not, it's not okay in an indirect speech because the direct speech has um, independent tense. It doesn't depend for its interpretation temporally on the matrix clause in that way. Um, so what makes these sentences different between two years ago, John said that Bach and two years ago, John said that Mary, uh, there's nothing overt that marks these. Uh, how about John told me Mary is holding her breath. Well, that's not even, um, if John told me uh, earlier this morning that Mary is holding her breath, that's probably ungrammatical. Um, because she can't be holding her, if it's late in the day and I say, he told me this early in the morning, she can't still be holding her breath. Uh, John told me Mary is holding, John told me two minutes ago, Mary is holding her breath. That's fine. John told me five minutes ago, Mary is holding her breath. That's risky. John told me an hour ago, Mary is holding her breath. That's already ungrammatical. So the time interval is important because we know in the real world, people can only hold their breath for a certain amount of time. So the so-called grammaticality and ungrammaticality uh, might be better characterized as what makes sense given our knowledge of the world. Um, and in the case of greatest composer, our knowledge of the world and our knowledge of our culture, because in the Pitaha, that wouldn't make any sense because they don't have composers. And so... Uh, even if I tried to invent a word, that would come out as ungrammatical in Pinaha. So is there a perfect tense in Pinaha? I said very clearly in 1993 that there is not a perfect tense in Pinaha because there's no R point, and I gave many arguments for that. But the other day, you know, as I was thinking about talking to you about this subject, I thought of a not too uncommon phrase, um, when the jungle entity, the jungle entity returned, you know, it, and the owl at the end can be interpreted as when, um, but it's actually that completive aspect that we mm -hmm. talked about. So when the jungle entity, it literally means jungle entity completed his return, you already ate. Um, the free translation is when jungle entity returned, you had eaten you had already ate. I think that's actually a possible meaning for that. And if that's the case, then there is possibly a perfect tense in Pitaha. 
contra Everett, and I have to rethink some of this analysis. Um, but uh, I'll, uh, although I know that these two sentences are grammatical, I am not sure. Um, so, so in other words, pinaha lacks a perfect tense. There, there's no question about that. There's no uh, morphological perfect tense. But does it lack a perfect tense interpretation? Um, that doesn't seem to be as solid a result as I once, ta once thought it was. And remember, if you're talking about interpretations, even in your native language, you're stepping into some fairly dangerous uh, uh, grounds because um, you have to really know what you're talking about to talk about interpretations. If you're talking about phonetics, you can put it on the instruments and it's there or it's not there. If you're talking about phonology, you can use the instruments, you can make certain predictions. Um, it's a little question because phonology in a sense is an interpretation of phonetics. Um, if you're talking about the syntax, the morphal syntax, do you see the words there? Well, then it's in the syntax. Do you see the morphemes there? Well, then it's in the morphology. But when you're talking about the interpretation, all that, so phonology is to phonetics in a sense as semantics is to syntax, they interpret each other. Um, um, then it's, it becomes more difficult to say what interpretations are absolutely impossible. So um, since in 1993, I made the claim that this would not have an, a, perfective, a perfect impre, um, interpretation. Uh, these days, I'm not so sure. Uh, and this is given to underscore uh, the difficulty of semantics. Um, so I speak the language fluently. Um, and I, you know, I don't speak that many languages, but the ones I speak, I speak well. Um, and, uh, and yet, even as a, somebody who speaks the language, I would have to get back to the village and investigate this with numerous speakers. And the way that I do this in terms of field work, if you're interested, is I have a speaker uh, listen to the recorded phrase from one tape recorder and then speak into the other tape recorder while I'm still playing the first recorder, what their interpretation is. And then I will go to other speakers and repeat this until I have tapes of various people interpreting the sentence. And from that, I try to uh, triangulate a meaning. Um, and, and so it's difficult. Doing field work on semantics is, is not uh, trivial. Um, so one point that emerges from all of this from uh, for cognitive science in general is that semiotic processes can have one-to-one -one or one-to-many and many-to-one signs. So pitaha tenses, uh, semantic tenses, the semantic interpretations are many-to-one. I need several morphemes to narrow it down to one interpretation. In pitaha aspects, I usually have one-to-one, -one, and aspect means what it means, and um, it doesn't need another morpheme to produce that particular aspectual meaning. Peter Ha ambiguity, as in many other languages, many to one signs, um, a sign that has um, one sign that has many meanings is ambiguity, and this is common in the world's languages. Um, consider again two years ago, John said that Bach is, was the greatest composer of all time versus two years ago, John said that Mary is pregnant versus two years ago, John said that Mary was pregnant. How do we put all this information together? It is inference based on building one set of signs from another that is a form of compositionality. And as I have said before, when we synthesize our knowledge about the world, that seems to be pretty much the same process as synthesizing the meaning of a sentence from the individual words, uh, which is called the linguistics compositionality, but this compositionality seems to extend beyond the sentence. And even in individual sentences, the meaning of that sentence that is composed is composed not merely of the words, but it's composed from the context and um, things that are, uh, that are not found in one location in the sentence or even in the discourse. I may not know that something is past tense until I look at the larger discourse. So compositionality and inference is not sentence bound, as we've seen many times, nor is it bound to one sign. It, there's no theory of semiotics which requires that every symbol has one meaning or that two symbols can't work together to produce a meaning. Um, semiotics is a, is a richer field than that. So what is inference 
based on when we interpret a sentence. It's based on everything we know, parallel and serial processing of what is not said and non-direct saying to construct the semiotics of speech or in speaker intentions. We must avoid confusing the representamen, that is the physical form, the sign, with the interpretation as a serious problem. Uh, and we can, we can put this back into phonology. Um, Pinaha, I can say legitimately, does not have an M phoneme. There's no bilabial nasal phoneme in Pitaha. But if you visit the Pitaha, you'll hear, you will hear bilabial nasals all over the place. Why is that? Because they're allophones. They're not perceived by the native speakers as being essential, but they are part of the language. They're part of the interpretation. So um, the, the phonology can often interpret the phonetics of Pitaha to eliminate the M, but the M is there. So you see the M, but it's not there um, in the actual uh, phonology, um, in the phonemics. Um, so meaning is not one-to-one -one correlated uh, by the syntax or the morphology and vice versa. Um, so you can have syntactic phrases like idioms, which uh, it would be a mistake to try to translate every word. This is again, reflected to some degree in construction grammar and role and reference grammar. So this is not something entirely new. Other theories can handle this. But if your theory is based on strict compositionality from the bottom up as, the, uh, as where meaning comes from, well, you're not gonna be able to account for these things. Um, in his article in language, uh, Floyd, working on Yengatu, argues that the gestures are part of the grammar and you can't have the grammar without the gestures. Um, at least what that means, I mean, he could very well be right that we have to have uh, separate morphemes for gestures written in uh, as symbols into the sentence. And, and when you see that you have a gesture, uh, but what it really means ultimately for any theory, so you don't have to get theory specific, is simply that um, the gestures, the intonation, the body posture, what has gone before, the cultural expectations, the environment, what's happening again around us right now. These are all synthesized very quickly by the speaker and the hearer to communicate and interpret meanings, um, uh, which exceed by far what is present in the sentence itself. So I've often said this, that language is kind of a filter on what we can interpret. Uh, syntax, morpho syntax is a small teeny part of our language that aids us to interpret, but to define language as syntax is to miss the point of everything that we have said um, this morning or this afternoon um, about using and synthesizing information from various sources simultaneously to get a meaning. Um, that's what I had for you today. I'm sorry for the irregularity. Um, we're, we only have a couple of lectures left. I'll probably have to cut this series a bit short because of other commitments that are starting to impinge upon me. But um, once again, if you have additional questions or any questions of any kind, comments, uh, feel free to contact me through the Aberlein site. Um, and uh, I look forward to our next class together, which is uh, identified in the syllabus. Thanks very much.